Before we start the show, just a quick reminder to please subscribe to this podcast wherever you're receiving it and give us a five-star rating. It helps us beat the big tech algorithm. And if you like the show, then you might be interested in becoming a backstage subscriber where you'll have access to our entire back catalog of episodes. Visit redpilledamerica.com and click support for details. Thanks, everyone. It's startling how far our culture has shifted in just a few years. In 2008, this was Obama. I believe that marriage uh, is the union between a man and a woman. But by the end of his term, he abruptly changed his tune. I think same-sex couples should be able to get married. Here's another example. This is what a Democrat president sounded like in the 1990s. We are a nation of immigrants, but we are also a nation of laws. It is wrong and ultimately self-defeating for a nation of immigrants to permit the kind of abuse of our immigration laws we have seen in recent years, and we must do more to stop it. And this is what a Democrat presidential candidate sounds like today. These people are just waiting, waiting for a chance to be able to contribute fully. And by that standard, 11 million undocumented aliens are already Americans in my view. Over an incredibly short amount of time, our culture has drastically shifted to a point where America looks almost unrecognizable. Jasmine, you're one of the youngest and first drag queen slash kids, and I've heard How late in the third trimester could a, a physician perform an abortion if he indicated it would impair the mental health of the, of the woman? So, I mean, through the third trimester. The third trimester goes all the way up to 40 weeks. Okay, but to the end of the third trimester. Yep, I don't think we have a limit in the bill. This is Drag Queen Story Hour. It's your classic children's reading program with a twist. The day's literary leader is a larger-than-life drag queen. Not all boys have a penis and not all girls have a vagina. How has American culture shifted so dramatically? I'm Patrick Carelci. And I'm Adriana Cortez. And this is Red Pilled America, a storytelling show. This is not another talk show covering the day's news. We are all about telling stories. Stories Hollywood doesn't want you to hear. Stories the media mocks. Stories about everyday Americans that the elites ignore. You could think of Red Pilled America as audio documentaries, and we promise only one thing. The truth. Welcome to Red Pilled America. A few years ago, Adriana and I had an awakening moment. It came while talking with a literary agent who was helping us develop our book proposal. This wasn't just any agent. He happened to be the same guy that represented Donald Trump for his most recent book. He confessed that he removed the president from his portfolio of book sales for fear of being blacklisted from the storytelling industry. The moment led to a deep understanding of how American culture has shifted so drastically. We want you to follow us on a journey that led to this awakening because it will not only give you a better understanding of how this shift happened, it'll also show what America First conservatives can do to change it. The awakening started for us in the summer of 2016. At the time, the political environment had taken a decidedly dark turn. The vitriol toward Trump supporters had reached an apex, escalating to the level of open violence when the MAGA crowd was pummeled right in front of the police at a San Jose campaign rally. This was one of the most violent scenes I have ever witnessed at a Trump rally. At times, it seemed like the police had no control of the situation. People were getting beat up right in front of them. And these were not clashes. These were pure attacks. Trump supporters, men, women, even the elderly, left this building last night and walked right into danger. At the time, our family lived in the heart of La La Land. Our little girl was attending a prestigious Hollywood private school. So we were amongst Tinseltown's elite a group that was uniformly leftist. The parents at our daughter's school had known for years that we were conservatives. However, shortly after the Democratic National Convention kicked off, the word started to spread that we were also the unthinkable. The Karelchis were Trump supporters. How'd they find that out? 
Well, a year earlier, right-wing pundit Eric Erickson disinvited Donald Trump to an annual conservative convention, an act that launched the Never Trump movement. Donald Trump hits back when people challenge him. In the first Republican debate on Thursday, Fox News moderator Megyn Kelly pushed Trump on some of the disparaging comments he's made in the past about women. Now Trump has hurled his latest insults at Megyn Kelly. On CNN last night, he seemed to suggest her tough questioning style was related to her menstrual cycle. She gets out and she starts asking me all sorts of ridiculous questions. And, you know, you could see there was blood coming out of her eyes, uh, blood coming out of her wherever. Following all of this, Trump, as we said, was disinvited from this conservative event here in Atlanta. And the organizer of today's Red State Gathering did talk about that decision. Listen to this. I think it was inappropriate. I really think it was inappropriate. I've got my wife here. I've got my daughter here. I've got 800 friends of mine here. It's a family-friendly program. And if he's not going to clarify that this isn't what he meant, I don't think I want him at my event. And so the campaign manager called me back and said, Mr. Trump had said whatever. He was trying to move the questions along, that she was bleeding out of her eyes or whatever, trying to get Don Lemon to move beyond, or at least he meant whatever. Uh, I asked him if he was going to clarify that publicly. They said no. So I said, I'm sorry. Um, I would prefer Mr. Trump not come to the event. Disgusted by my fellow right-wingers' attempt at taking him down, I penned an op-ed for Breitbart News arguing that Donald Trump had a real shot at winning the whole thing and that we should give the real estate mogul a chance. So when the DNC kicked off, word of the op-ed quickly traveled through the Tinseltown grapevine. In that summer of 2016, people like us who were publicly out right-wingers behind enemy lines had to make one of three choices. Option one, continue to speak out in support of Trump. Option two, go fool never Trump by suggesting your former colleagues were white supremacists. But we could never do that. Then there was option three, one that went against every fiber of our being. Make the decision to lay low politically and weather the storm. For the few months left in the campaign, we decided to go through door number three. We weren't afraid for ourselves. Being in the fight was nothing new to us. We'd been harassed for our political beliefs in the past. But now we had a child that was out in the public, vulnerable to attack. Her school was infected with Trump derangement syndrome. These parents were A-OK with an adult kid cuddler roaming our school. So who knew what they were capable of? We weren't going to take any chances with our daughter. So laying low for a few months was the plan. But the tough part was I'd gotten the urge to pick up writing again. So I began looking around for a non-political story to explore and noticed something interesting happening in the world of big tech. A new music piracy trend was quickly sweeping the globe. Imagine a website that acted like a cassette recorder for music that was streaming online. These sites were called stream rippers, named after their ability to rip audio from streamed music. And they each had something in common. Every one of them mined YouTube for songs. All you had to do to get almost any song you could think of for free was find the song on YouTube, copy the link, paste the link into a field on these websites, press enter, and the site would copy the song from YouTube and download it to your computer. It was that easy. No one had to buy music ever again. And YouTube, astonishingly, was doing nothing to stop it. As web traffic to these stream-ripping sites rose, digital music sales plummeted. And perhaps the most shocking thing about this music downloading orgy was that it wasn't clear that it was illegal. For those of us old enough to remember, when the VHS recorder first came out, the film industry sued VHS makers, claiming recorders were illegally copying television broadcasts. But as we know today, the VHS survived that claim. So it could be argued that these stream rippers were doing the same thing for the internet. This development was troubling to me, because my daughter was showing an aptitude for singing. These sites had the potential to end the ability for anyone to make money on music sales. So I did some digging into the story and learned that no one was writing about this growing phenomenon. Based on my analysis, it appeared that people were downloading roughly 10 billion songs a year from these sites for free. It was a major issue for the music industry. So Adriana and I began doing what we do. 
we barreled down and did some research and interviewed some experts on digital music and intellectual property law. When we thought we had enough, we wrote an article in what is now our signature storytelling format. We followed the rise of the most popular stream-ripping website in the world called youtube-mp3.org and how it was destroying the financial viability of one of the most celebrated songs of all time, USA for Africa's We Are the World. The stream-ripping website was created by a programmer in Germany. This one man had developed a tool that was making the sales of digital music obsolete. Now, for writers that happen to be right-wingers, getting a story like this published can be a bit tricky. Most articles on conservative websites range from 800 to 1,500 words tops. This story was approaching 5,000 words, which is referred to in the writing world as long-form journalism. You're listening to an audio version of long-form journalism right now. Conservative media just doesn't publish this kind of thing. On the other hand, there was a long list of left-leaning websites where a story like this was right in their wheelhouse. In fact, left-wing media regularly publishes long-form journalism, which explains part of how our culture has drastically shifted to the left. What most people don't know is that, just like superhero movies are derived from comic books, many films are adapted from long-form journalism. The list of articles that have been made into movies could double as an Oscar nomination list. Argo, White Boy Rick, Spotlight, War Dogs, Dog Day Afternoon, American Gangster, Saturday Night Fever, The Bling Ring, and The Hustlers were all movies that were adapted from long-form articles. Hollywood likes to use the storytelling form as source material because it helps flush out the idea for a movie. This long-form journalism also allows writers to fine-tune their storytelling chops. Knowing this made it even more surprising that not one conservative outlet at the time was accepting long-form journalism submissions. If your story was over 1,500 words, your chance of getting it published on a conservative outlet was near zero. That's still largely the case today. So instead of pitching conservative media our stream-ripping story, I began to shop the story around to left-leaning outlets, ones that focused either on Silicon Valley or the music industry. I figured that the story had nothing to do with politics, so our conservative leanings shouldn't get in the way. We also weren't some novice writers. Our stories had led to the resignation of a White House appointee and forced the Obama administration to adopt new conduct guidelines. Andrew Breitbart had even sponsored me for a Pulitzer. With our pedigree, publishing a story about a massive new music piracy should be a piece of cake, I thought. I first reached out to Billboard magazine, and they were initially intrigued, but then all of a sudden went cold on me. I pitched The Atlantic. They too liked it, but then abruptly declined. I started going down the list. I sent it to The Verge, California Sunday, Rolling Stone, The Hollywood Reporter, basically everyone that published long-form journalism, but no one bit. In fact, most weren't even responding. I was surprised. This was a story that no one was covering, and stream ripping was negatively impacting the music industry on a scale that we hadn't seen since Napster. Still, no one would touch it. I couldn't help but think it was because we were conservatives. So instead of shelving the story, I turned to a trusty old friend, the editor-in-chief of Breitbart News, a whip-smart young man named Alex Marlowe. If any one editor could be credited for Trump's election win, that editor would be Alex. Even in the midst of the election chaos, Alex gave me the thumbs up, and he published our stream ripping piece. Within days, I was being interviewed by the Wall Street Journal for a story they were running on this music piracy trend. I spoke to a YouTube representative that assured me that the company would take action. I talked to a spokesman for the Recording Industry Association of America, or the RIAA, the trade organization that protects the financial vitality of the music industry. And within just a few weeks of our talk, the RIAA filed an international lawsuit to send a message to stream ripping developers all across the world. We were right. This story was important. And all the left-leaning outlets knew it. And how did we know that? Well, because almost every site that I pitched the story to was now covering the lawsuit. The following year, the largest stream ripper in the world agreed to close down its site. Others followed, and it all started with our long-form article. It was a good feeling. Another story we'd written had moved the needle. But the biggest lesson that we learned along the way was that left-wing websites were the only ones publishing long-form storytelling journalism. 
we knew that this was significant at the time, but we couldn't quite pin down why. However, we were about to find out. More after the break. Welcome back. So a few weeks after the music industry sued the stream ripping site featured in our story, the unthinkable happened. Huge news, uh, actually. The AP now projecting that Donald Trump has won the state of Pennsylvania. That is uh, the race, frankly. Uh, there is no path forward for Hillary Clinton. The media were shocked. All of what a night! It, and and a, a complete earthquake. This was an earthquake unlike any earthquake I've really seen since Ronald Reagan in 1980. It just came out of nowhere. Well, my crystal ball's been shattered into atoms here because I predicted the exact opposite of what happened. Well, look, this is an extraordinary story. I think it's fair to say, and I've talked to some historians as well, it's the biggest political shocker, I won't say upset in the sense that some people have been further behind than Trump was, but the biggest political shocker in American history, uh, the idea that Donald J. Trump, a man who's never been a politician, who never served as a general of the army, is the next president of the United States. Aside from a few Fox News pundits, every cable news personality and mainstream media news outlet were blindsided by his victory. And they weren't the only ones. The film, music, literary, and advertising industries were all stunned. Their disbelief sparked an idea. If this crowd was truly dumbstruck by Trump's victory, they had absolutely no understanding of middle America. And that was an opportunity. With our marketing background and being one of the earliest to publicly proclaim Trump could win, we thought we'd write a book that explained this cultural phenomenon that led to this middle America revolt at the ballot box, and we were going to take a storytelling approach to doing it. So we began to look at the landscape of the book publishing world. We were accomplished short story writers, but knew nothing about the literary industry. What we quickly learned was that conservatives were ghettoized within the world of book publishing. Let us explain. For an earlier episode of Red Pilled America, we interviewed Brett Easton Ellis, the famed author of best-selling novels Less Than Zero and American Psycho. Brett is a gay man, and for many reasons, he kept that under wraps because he didn't want to get pigeonholed as a gay author. Otherwise, his book manuscripts would be funneled solely to the LGBT publishers that only targeted gay readers. Basically, Brett wanted a broad audience. He didn't want to be confined to the ghetto of gay publishers. Right-leaning authors have a very similar problem. Once a book publisher sniffs out that you are a conservative, even if your book has little to do with politics, you are ghettoized by being funneled to the small handful of conservative publishers that solely target right-wing readers. On the other hand, if you are a liberal writer or an author that explores pro-left-wing themes, you have access to the general publishing world where storytelling flourishes. Think books like Sex and the City, The Godfather, The Hunger Games, Friday Night Lights, All the President's Men, Into the Wild, The Basketball Diaries. These were all books that were made into movies or TV shows. This was the second avenue of storytelling that we found that had a roadblock to conservatives. Just like long-form journalism online, storytelling in the book publishing business was also completely dominated by the left. Again, we got a peek behind the curtain on why American culture has shifted so far leftwards. You see, the stories we consume help define our culture. They help infuse morals into our society. There's a reason why stories are used throughout the Bible. It's the best way to convey the ideas of Jesus Christ. Stories help us understand where we come from and where we're going. They help us pass on knowledge to future generations and record our history. If information is given to us in story format, we remember it more. When we read stories as a child, they help our little minds define right from wrong, good from evil, and acceptable from unacceptable. Storytelling in the hands of the right person can teach us the importance of family. In the wrong hands, people can be convinced to dismantle our traditions. Storytelling is the most persuasive weapon man has ever devised. One experiment helps illustrate this fact. Talk about this one project, Significant Objects. I don't know how familiar people are with it. I'm assuming my mic is OK. Everybody can hear me, so I will proceed. Rob Walker is a journalist and author of Buying In, the secret dialogue between what we buy and who we are. It's a book about the emotional connection between people and the things they buy. 
We met Rob around 2006 when he interviewed us for his book. A few years later, he developed a project called Significant Objects. He explained his fascinating experiment in a 2010 speech. Significant Objects, uh, significantobjects.com uh, is a, in a nutshell, a project I do with Joshua Glenn where we take thrift store, yard sale objects, low value objects, and have great creative writers invent stories about them. And then we post the story and the object on our site and more to the point on eBay. And we see if the invented story uh, enhances the value of the object as measured by an eBay auction. So he purchased a bunch of thrift store paraphernalia. An ashtray, coffee cups, buttons, an old Fred Flintstone Pez dispenser, a jar of marbles, stuff with almost no value, and asked a different author to write a story for each item. And we made some parameters in terms of how we were thinking about what kind of story. Not that many parameters. We wanted the stories to be relatively short, 500 words or fewer. We were totally fine with people writing very short things, just a paragraph if they wanted to. That was fine. We didn't want the stories to refer to the object being sold on eBay. Uh, and then we, we did have one rule that the, their stories had to be, it, it, the object had to be important to the story. We had a couple of things come in in the very beginning when they would just sort of leave the uh, object as an, almost an afterthought. He then placed each item on eBay with their backstory to see what it would resell for. What he found was that the near worthless products significantly increased in price. Oh, and in the end, I guess I should give you the big statistics. For the first 100 um, objects, we sold $128.74 worth of objects for uh, $3,612.51, which is a 2,706% significance markup, as I like to call it. The infusion of an author's story into the product added a tremendous value to a worthless item. The left understands this power of a story. The right, for now, does not. We eventually found a literary agent who agreed to help develop our book for a potential sale to a publisher. But after months of working with us to fine-tune the manuscript, he abruptly dropped our project. We'll get to the reason why later in the show. But these awakening moments, first realizing that the left dominated storytelling online, then seeing that they controlled it in the book publishing arena as well, got us to wondering how this came to be. How did the left get control of such a powerful tool of persuasion? Our curiosity eventually led us down another rabbit hole for a Breitbart news story, where we searched for how the left dominated a third avenue of storytelling, that being Hollywood. And what we uncovered brought the entire picture of America's dramatic cultural shift into focus. At the birth of Hollywood's film industry, the entire enterprise was plagued with conflict. Municipal and state censorship boards, patent enforcers, and decency groups all threatened to block film producers from freely making and exhibiting their movies. So, to fight back against the opposition, the Hollywood studios of the time decided to join forces through a trade association to focus their defense. As trying as those early battles were, working together had a notable benefit for the studios. They created major roadblocks for all future newcomers. By the late 1920s, the film industry was already becoming an oligopoly, where, through collusion, an industry reduces competition and eventually is dominated by a very small number of players. The barriers to entry into the film business have been so enduring and impenetrable that all of the major studios that exist today had their roots in this early era. Some abuses came with this near-monopolistic power, including studio executives cheating writers out of screenplay credits, so in 1933, the Screenwriters Guild formed to establish criteria for doling out writing credits so screenwriters would stop getting screwed. The union's efforts seemed admirable, but the Writers Guild had another covert mission in play. They wanted to control the supply of screenplays for the entire movie industry. If they controlled the documents that made the movies, they could wield that power to force studios to submit to their demands, including control over film content. The problem was, the most active members in the Writers Guild were literally communists. Its first president was John Howard Lawson, who shortly after the formation of the Guild was named the head of the Hollywood division of the Communist Party USA. He would later become one of the blacklisted Hollywood Ten. 
Screenwriters under Lawson's thumb couldn't just freely write. They had to ask for permission from the Communist Party leaders. Lawson even reviewed screenplays before the studios. In one instance, when a screenwriter published an essay about how politics should stay out of the films, Lawson wrote a scathing rebuttal entitled, Art is a Weapon, arguing that the writer's thoughts betrayed Marxism. The offending screenwriter literally crawled to repent before Lawson at a Communist Party meeting. In Tinseltown in the 1930s, the communist and the Hollywood left were one and the same. After the Writers Guild won a prolonged fight against Hollywood studios to be recognized as the sole union representing screenwriters, the radical left within the union, who were now the ranking members, seized control of the Writers Guild. Many members started sensing this power shift, including Maury Riskin, the legendary screenwriter of many Marx Brothers movies and one of the key players in winning studio recognition for the Guild. In his book, I Shot an Elephant in My Pajamas, one of the funniest autobiographies you'll ever read, by the way, Maury stated that the Communist Party members within the Writers Guild, who were now in control of the union, hoped to use the Guild as their power base to, quote, bring all facets of the motion picture industry under the control of one all-encompassing super union, which would be controlled by and serve the purposes of the Communist Party, end quote. Now in control of the Writers Guild, the far left began squeezing out those that didn't think like them. They were pioneering the soft blacklist that conservatives in Hollywood face today. Famed Western actor John Wayne personally witnessed this power grab by the left. The radical liberals were going to take over our business. They were getting themselves into a position where they could uh, control who would do the writing. Their power was so entrenched that one communist screenwriter who witnessed his colleague crawl to beg forgiveness from Lawson wanted to quit the Communist Party but didn't know how because the communists were, quote, placed in strategic positions throughout the industry. Withdrawal from them would have meant professional and economic suicide, end quote. So in 1944, Maury Riskin, along with Walt Disney, Clark Gable, Cecil B. DeMille, Gary Cooper, and later John Wayne, formed the first Hollywood conservative group to fight the radical left's takeover of their industry. Leaders throughout Movie City asked Congress to look into the growing communist infiltration of Hollywood. In response, Washington, D.C. formed the House Un-American Activities Committee to investigate and asked industry heavyweights like Walt Disney to weigh in on the communist takeover of Tinseltown and the Screenwriters Guild. The thing that, that I resent the most is that they are able to get into these unions and take them over and represent to the world that a group of people that are in my plant that I know are good 100% Americans uh, have, are trapped by this group and they're represented to the world as supporting all of those ideologies, and it's not so. And I feel that, uh, that they really ought to be smoked out and shown up for what they are so that all the good free causes in this country, all the liberalisms that really are American, can go out without this taint of communism. This was no light matter. Stalin killed millions of his own citizens. Unlike today's Russian collusion hoax, the communist threat in America at the time was very real because many in power positions were aligned with their cause, including in Tinseltown. The leaders of the Screenwriters Guild wholeheartedly embraced the Communist Party, one that aimed to overthrow the U.S. government by force if necessary. With pressure mounting, in 1947, Nine screenwriters and one film director were asked to testify before the House Un-American Activities Committee to answer to their Communist Party ties. When the group, who came to be known as the Hollywood Ten, refused to answer questions, each were found guilty of contempt of Congress, sentenced to a year in jail, and blacklisted by the film studios. The Hollywood blacklist era had begun. Movie City typically characterizes this era as a conservative-led witch hunt against heroes of free speech. But like our current fake news-loving mainstream media, Tinseltown has hidden a big part of the story about the Hollywood blacklist era. It was actually the far left that started the era by methodically squeezing out and blacklisting conservative writers. John Wayne recalled this fact. You must realize what was going on at that time in our business. Well, I was going to ask... There was a heated... There was a heated thing going on. They were uh, 
a lot of people that that were fine riders were getting uh, weren't being used, and it was it was rough on them. And that's why I took up for that side because uh, Maury Riskin, who was a Pulitzer Prize winner, couldn't get a job because he didn't think exactly like these fellows. That's what started it, not us trying to throw them out. After testifying before the House and American Activities Committee as a friendly witness, the extraordinary talented Maury Riskin never again received an offer from a studio. Have more order, please. Uh, Mr. Riskin. And I think if we're going to spend $12 billion or whatever it is to contain the communists in Greece, that we ought to spend at least a couple of bucks over here and do something about that, what good is it doing it over there and not, not getting rid of it here? I'm perfect. Look, I wouldn't want a bill that would hurt the political expression of any American. But I think it's been proved beyond any doubt that the, Ameri that the American Communist Party is not an American Communist Party. If it were, I'm afraid I would be sucker enough to defend its right to speak and to preach. But it's been proven it isn't. It's an agent of a foreign government as the Bulgarian Communist Party is, as the Korean Communist Party is, as the German Communist Party is. When the official blacklist era came to an end in 1960, liberals continued where they left off. They started freezing out conservatives again, but this time with much more success. I think there's a reverse blacklist even today now. Director and Hollywood 10 member Edward Dimitrick admitted as much in a 1976 documentary on the blacklist. I think that the, the liberals who are, are riding high uh, are uh, going in the opposite direction. I think some of the, of the fellows back then who were on the reactionary side are having a tough time getting jobs now. This de facto blacklist has been fully institutionalized. Screenwriter and MSNBC host Lawrence O'Donnell conveyed this fact in 2003 when he stated, quote, The Writers Guild of America, my union, is at a minimum 99% leftist liberal and, like me, socialist, end quote. In the years after the blacklist era, up to this very day, the left gained complete control of La La Land and in the process captured the most powerful avenue of storytelling. How does this time in American history play a part in the cultural shift we've witnessed today? Through storytelling, Hollywood plays an incredibly influential role in defining American culture, and the people exerting that influence are all leftists. The messages delivered through films and TV shows create the boundaries of acceptable discussion, Hollywood has pushed the conversation on abortion, illegal immigration, race, gender, family, religion, and sexual preference far to the left. And the influence that Tinseltown leftists exert reaches deep into the other avenues of storytelling. At the peak of the blacklist era in 1955, a Hollywood trade organization estimated that over 50% of the movies they examined were adapted from novels. Today that trend endures. Hollywood buys the film rights to nonfiction books, novels, long-form journalism, comic books, and now even podcasts. A growing number of left-leaning storytelling podcasts have been adapted into TV shows and films. Shall we get started? The Amazon TV show Homecoming, starring Julia Roberts, is a different kind of adaptation, transformed not from a book, but from a podcast. Why does the Homecoming podcast make for a great TV show? It's a thriller, um, and it's fiction, so it's almost like television for your ears. Matt Lieber founded Gimlet Media nearly five years ago to produce podcasts, hits like Homecoming and Crime Town. But today, a whole division of the company is devoted to turning podcasts into movies and TV series. And some of these podcasts are generating millions of listens, so there's already this base of people that are interested in the subject matter. With more than a quarter of the U.S. population listening monthly, Hollywood is desperate to cash in. Storytelling podcasts on the left are experiencing a renaissance and many of them were launched in hopes that Hollywood would one day come knocking to adapt their stories for TV or the big screen. But the studios largely only buy the rights to storytelling works created by left-wing writers. It's why Red Pilled America is the only weekly storytelling podcast for America First conservatives. No one else on the right is willing to put the massive amount of effort into a show of this nature if Hollywood will never come knocking. Hollywood's purchase power has forced storytelling on all other platforms to follow Tinseltown's liberal model because storytellers want their work made into movies, which explains why the entire storytelling industry is left-leaning. 
except for a few outliers like Red Pilled America. Go out and try to find another show like ours. You won't be able to, because the left has blocked people like us from the storytelling industry. Which brings us back to the question, how has American culture drifted so drastically to the left? One primary reason is that the left has cornered the market on what actually shifts culture. The left has cornered the market on storytelling. Whenever possible, the left purges right-wingers from their mist so that they retain monopoly control of the weapon that actually shapes American culture. Remember earlier when we said our original book manuscript was picked up by a literary agent? Well, it wasn't just any agent. As we mentioned at the outset of this episode, it was the same agent that represented Donald Trump for the release of his most recent book. Our manuscript appeared to be in good hands, and for months its development was going great. But then an unrelated event seemed to put our book project in jeopardy. Simon & Schuster abruptly canceled the book deal of Milo Yiannopoulos, the gifted conservative writer. The left had been pushing for Simon & Schuster to drop Milo from the first second his book deal was announced. The publisher eventually found a reason to bend the knee to the outrage mob. Within just a few weeks of his cancellation, our agent dropped our book. On his way out, I was reminded of something he told me earlier. He confessed that he removed Donald Trump from his portfolio of book sales for fear of being blacklisted from the industry. Let that sink in for a moment. Someone literally removed the President of the United States from his resume for fear that he'd never work in the storytelling business again. If just being associated with the president could get you blacklisted, our book didn't stand a chance of surviving in this leftist-dominated industry. We'd have to strike out on our own. The left will never let you or us in. They'll never allow us into Hollywood. I know these people. We've spent nearly a decade with their families. We've spent Easter and Christmas and the 4th of July with these liberal elites. We've gone on vacations with them, and we can say with certainty that they'll never let America First conservatives into Hollywood. People often like to point out Clint Eastwood movies or Tim Allen and Roseanne Barr sitcoms as proof that Hollywood embraces conservatives, but it's all a facade. Every writer on Tim Allen's Last Man Standing show, besides Tim Allen himself, is liberal. Every writer from The Roseanne Show, besides Roseanne herself, was liberal. Clint Eastwood's new movie, Richard Jewell, is being lauded as a conservative-themed movie. And maybe it is. But the screenwriter for that film, a guy named Billy Ray, is a rabid anti-Trump zealot. He's also adapting disgraced former FBI director James Comey's book into a miniseries that will double as a Trump hit piece right before the election. And it doesn't stop with him. Every one of the main characters in Richard Jewell is an anti-Trump leftist. The movie is simply designed for leftist Hollywood to reach into the pockets of conservatives, then take that money to attack everything we love about America. I'm not saying not to support Clint Eastwood, but you deserve the truth. There are some incredibly brave conservatives in Hollywood that we should support. Actors like Nick Searcy and Adam Baldwin come to mind. But it's important to admit that nothing that comes out of the major Hollywood studios is designed to benefit the conservative movement. They will never let us in. And frankly, I don't blame them. They beat the right and cornered the storytelling market. If it were us, would we let them in? In order for America First conservatives to have a chance at shifting culture back towards the right, we will need to build our own storytelling platforms, build our own Hollywood, build our own podcasts, and yes, publish our own books. That's what we did. If you haven't purchased our first book, Awakenings, yet, please help us spread our message by buying our book today at redpilledamerica.com. And please tell your friends to do the same. It ships immediately. Red Pilled America is doing everything possible to build a new storytelling platform for America First conservatives. We must take back the culture, because if we don't, and we let the left continue to pump their stories into the minds of our people, what looks unthinkable today will be tomorrow's cultural norm. A lot of people think that if you're attracted to kids that you you have some kind of like unusual degree of urge to go out and, you know, attack kids, and it's not like that. Most people, you know, when they see somebody that they're attracted to, do they automatically think, oh, I want to jump on them and have sex with them. So it's the same with us, it's just, you know, 
We just happen to be attracted to kids. Red Pilled America is an iHeartRadio original podcast. It's produced by me, Adriana Cortez, and Patrick Carelci. Now, our entire archive of episodes are only available to backstage subscribers. Subscribers get access to our entire archive of episodes, as well as our behind-the-scenes podcast. To become a backstage subscriber, please visit redpilledamerica.com and click the support button in the top menu. That's redpilledamerica.com and click support in the top menu. Thanks for listening. 